Artificial intelligence has now advanced to the point where it can create really good video clips, but the technology still continues to have some incidents where it seems to go berserk. We're going to talk about these and other tech news on this episode of Today in Tech. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Today in Tech. I'm Keith Shaw. The guy behind the monitors is Chris. Hey, Chris. Hey, how's it going? It's going well. And we are also happy to have our latest guest co-host join us for the next few weeks. Uh, Paul Desmond is the principal and co-founder of Saratoga B2B Group and a veteran IT journalist and editor. Uh, welcome to the show, Paul. Thank you, Keith. Pleasure to be here. All right. So it's it's going to be it's going to be a fun four weeks. I can I can tell you now. Uh, talk a little bit about kind of what you know what you bring to the the world of technology journalism and and analysis. Sure. Uh, well, currently uh, I actually have two companies. One uh, they're both focused on helping IT companies develop marketing content. So I'm writing about IT day in day out. Uh, the oldest one is is PD Edit, which is pure writing, blog posts, white papers, that kind of thing. And the other is Saratoga B2B Group, which I formed about four to five years ago with a, a partner, Charlie Spector, who has uh, SEO expertise. So, you know, we can help companies actually ensure somebody reads all the content that we produce. And uh, before all that, I spent 11 years at Network World as a reporter and editor, which is where I, I first learned. About That's how I know you. <laughs> I'm just kidding. That's how I know you. Keith. That's right. I met lots of fine people there. There you go. There you go. All right, let's jump into the, the news this week. I'm, I'm sure you were pretty impressed by this as I was. Um, OpenAI uh, introduced a new technology that uses artificial intelligence to create high quality videos from text descriptions. The company released short clips that showed vivid, seemingly realistic videos, including woolly mammoths trekking across a snowy field, ocean waves crashing against the cliff shoreline, and people doing everyday things like reading a book or walking down a city street. OpenAI calls this new system Sora, where it takes a written prompt and through AI renders a richly detailed video. OpenAI is one of many companies like Alphabet's Google and Meta platforms that are looking to capitalize on new AI video developments. Uh, when we were approaching the world of AI video last year, when we were seeing some early efforts, it was all very morphy and very nightmare fuelish. It was uh, people that I think there was a, a, a Bud, you know, someone tried to imitate a Budweiser ad or like at a barbecue and those, and, you know, and like the fingers were wrong and, and people were downing beers in the wrong direction. Uh, but now a lot of this stuff seems to be uh, a lot better looking. If uh, Chris, if you go to that open AI site, the, the second link I sent you, um, if you scroll down, there's a lot of new uh, videos that again, yeah, there's, there's the, the person walking down the city street. That looks really good compared to what was going on. Um, what's interesting, too, is that after the news came out, every tech journalist site, every media site was, was like, oh, my gosh, this is the end of civilization as we know it. And Maybe on the video creation side, people were getting worried. Uh, what were some of your thoughts, uh, Paul, when, when you saw a lot of this stuff? Uh, I guess first, you know, before we delve into all the evil that's potentially lurking behind this, I, I <laughs> I think we should just revel for a minute and just how amazing it is that AI, that AI can do this. I mean, to me, it, it really shows the power of AI and, and the promise. I mean, it's, it's almost like you think something and the next minute, you know, you got a video of it. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't know, you know, who knows how close to the finished product it will be to what you're picturing in your mind. But still, I mean, to me, the whole idea is pretty impressive. But but it does, it raises some questions. I mean, first one, how much compute power is this going to take? I mean, it's, it's got to be significantly more than the chat GPT does. Sure. And, and, yeah, and, and these are small clips too. These are not, these are not full length movies. Um, but I'm, again, some of the imagination that went through it, I think Sam Altman tweeted out a bunch of things like, Hey, you know, give me some ideas. And you know, everyone was like, Oh, we'll try this. And then boom, it worked. Um, the company is not releasing this to the general public yet. Uh, they are doing this. They are, I guess, choosing you know specific researchers and and people because they want to make sure that it's going to be safe. Because obviously, what they saw with the image generation where they were just flat images, uh, people tended to try to say like, let's what's the the weirdest and stupidest thing we can show, but also can we create deep fake images? And we started seeing things like the Pope in a puffy jacket. We saw the whole Donald Trump. Uh, being arrested uh, meme that went out there. And so they've got, there's there's definitely political implications that have 
uh, that you have to think about. And then if you combine the video stuff with the AI voice cloning issues, uh, you start to start seeing the ability to create some some really potentially uh, misleading kind of kind of videos. Chris, you know, as you watch these, what what what, what enters your mind? That you're out of a job? <laughs> I'm going to be out of a job soon. Um, I mean, honestly, like, think about it. Like, just a year ago, um, you know, AI video was, wasn't looking good. Right. 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 Uh, everything looked muddy. You could, you could tell that the AI was trying, but it, it really wasn't getting there. You could definitely tell um, that it was an AI thing because of the, the oh, yeah, this morphing but, effect. And so from what I've seen here, it, these look like these could have just been CGI created. Uh, I mean, not even, not yeah. even like I'm looking at these for the first time yeah. and I'm looking at this one right here. Uh, it's like a, looks like it's like a rocket man or something. Yeah. And th that could be a commercial, right? That could be a car commercial. And this landscape shot right here, uh, you know, of this, uh, cliff edge with the ocean. That's, uh, that's pretty realistic yeah. uh, looking. And, um, yeah, I mean, it's. I'm kind of worried about it, yeah. I mean, because we've already seen other AI apps out there that can, you know, in a way, somewhat replace some light jobs of an editor, right? Right, right. And now, like, I'm looking at this, these AI-generated clips, and it's like, wow, this could totally replace stock images. Yep, in stock video. Stock images. In stock video. So, yeah. and and, you know people who don't know stock images like that's actually that's an actual industry out there especially for video right. creators and you know cinematographers who are trying to create a little extra on the side and stuff like that like yeah i'm, I'm kind of worried i'm kind of worried you know but, a little but bit, so. the, those people that that contribute that kind of a that video to a stock image site could take these tools and start creating their own unless you think that you would skip the yeah, middleman and go right to it yourself and yeah but that's not why yeah. people do that right people want to create pay, people want to you know use their brain and come up with their own original idea yeah. and at the end of the day they want to say hey i did that yeah i i, I, I spent all this time and effort yeah. in doing that and i think this is it's going to replace the the paintbrush so to speak yeah you know um, I, and i can I, see I even in, in, in hollywood people doing this for storyboarding or you know people creating storyboard apps now um, if they could do it faster than what you would hand sketch something, uh, or, or, or the short video, f you know, uh, influencer, YouTube, Instagram type people, I, I would not be surprised if this gets released to see a lot of those features being embedded into all of those platforms. Yeah. And, and like, look at it this way real quick, real quick. Yeah. Um, Look, there's people out there saying, yeah, this it's not going to replace jobs and yeah, companies aren't going to use this and stuff like that. But it's like we've already started to see just a, a, sl a glimmer of it. Yeah. Um, especially with that uh, that Marvel show that came out. Um, Se oh, uh, Secret, Se Invasion. Secret Invasion. Yeah. That whole intro animation was AI generated. Right. Now imagine if you could do that without the animation part and actually create, you know, video. Like, look, if, if there, if, look, if, Companies and corporations are going to say, no, we're not going to use it. They're going to use it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I can see companies using it. I mean, lots of companies spend a lot of money creating promotional videos for different products and so forth. Yeah. And I mean, this can help them do that a lot cheaper. I can definitely see that happening. But I, I think it also raises the same copyright issues that, you know, when absolutely times raised with chat GPT. I mean, these images have to come from somewhere. Yeah. Absolutely. You and know, they were they were trained, you know. This 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 tool was trained on apparently tons of images, so those came from somewhere, right? You know, and it, it raises a bunch of issues. They, they, I don't know if they've actually revealed where the training set came from, but I'm sure that they're aware of. I mean, this is a drone shot. Thing. This is a drone shot. Yeah, but is that a is that a real place or is that you think that was procedurally generated? Like, was that generated oh, no, by the AI? Uh, my gut feeling is this probably is a real place. But someone could look at it and be like, "Oh, AI came up with that." But it, it looks, it looks convincing. Yeah, that is like a hundred percent convincing. Yeah. Uh, Paul, any any other thoughts on this? Like, again, do, should we be worried from the deep fake uh, implications and the the misinformation that could come out? Again, when you see when you see all these different angles, you could then start combining all of these things. 
And yeah, that I worries think me a little bit. You have to be worried about deep fakes. And it, it was interesting. I saw the first story I read about this, you know, brought that up and they, they mentioned watermarks. <laughs> I got a feeling like we're going to need more than watermarks. Yeah, you're going to need a lot more. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, you're going to have to, uh, we're going to have to be definitely on our toes on some of this stuff. But, I, but the other thing I thought about was, I, you know, I think with, with Gen AI in general, it's all about the prompt, really. And I, I think the prompts here are going to be huge. It, it, prompts could become an art form to craft videos that are you know, useful or artistic or whatever adjective you want to use. So I, I think we're going to see a lot of that. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I'm looking at this right here. Pixar is looking at this right now and Disney's looking at this and they're just thinking dollar signs. <laughs> Ching like But the thing the, is the three is animated uh, the, furry guy here. The thing is about well, I guess you could take this from a starting point and and it and it creates that image for you. But if you want to put that thing in a movie, you can't like in a full length movie. Like if you did the same prompt over and over again, don't you get different ver you know, you get different versions at least with pictures. I have a feeling <clears throat> They would use I, that as a baseline, and then they would go into their existing uh, process and workflows sure. and design characters like that. I have a feeling, and this is a gut feeling, they're going to find a way to make it work for them. <laughs> I'm, I'm serious. Okay. They're going to find yeah. a way. Yeah. Um, all right. So what, I think the next step would be to see when OpenAI decides if they want to release this to the general public or not. Um, uh, it, it certainly kind of throws down the, the, uh, oh, the term is the gantlet or the gauntlet. It's one of those. Um, they've basically said, or, Hey, everybody else, this is what we can do. Uh, time to start, you know, getting your yeah. act together and, and let's see what you've got. Cause again, we saw the same thing in the image space where it was, it was awful for a while. And now, the Dolly Three stuff is really good. Mid Journey, you know, upped its game, and and they can produce some really good stuff. Um, I, I'd be worried about Google. I, I don't think the Google stuff is very good at this point. So, uh, all right. But now we've said that we're all you know with the video stuff. But then there's there was another story that happened this week where apparently Chat GPT went berserk overnight. On it was like from Tuesday to Wednesday. Um, the, the service started throwing out unexpected responses on Tuesday night. According to an OpenAI status page, users posted screenshots of their ChatGPT conversations that were full of wild, nonsensical answers from the AI chatbot. Um, let's see. OpenAI said the issue was resolved about 11.14 a.m. Wednesday morning. And this is a quote. An optimization to the user experience introduced a bug with how the model process language said OpenAI in a stats update labeled postmortem. Uh, large language models use probabilities to figure out which word comes next in a sentence. OpenAI said the bug was located in the step where the model chooses these pro probabilities. This ended up producing word sequences that made no sense. Um, there were some like, if, if there's a Twitter page there, uh, Chris, um, they yeah, were basically, I I, I, yeah, 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 where it was just like they started repeating words. See if you can zoom in on some of that stuff. Um, there were some gibberish. emojis. There were a mix of English, Spanish, and straight gibberish. In some cases, ChatGPT was simply repeating the same phrase over and over again. Um, it even affected ChatGPT Enterprise, according to one user's post on X. And a user posted a video of ChatGPT writing a lengthy, manic essay in responses to a sim simple question. Um, there was some other speculation going on on the article that I read from, it was on Gizmodo. Uh, they, you know figuring out trying to where it went but then other people were just kind of making jokes about it. it was like wow that's a really cool song with this gibberish you know language so see even even ai needs to take a vacation <laughs> you think it was just they were tired could, could have they, been they just needed to turn on and off like could you turn on and off chat gpt again <laughs> to paul did, well, you know what what's your what's your thoughts on this uh, I, I think it's something of a warning signal for you know ai run amok i mean if, if i was a business Counting on Gen AI, you know, for something important. Right. I raise an eyebrow for sure. You know, all those hallucinations we always hear about with Chat TPT could have real world repercussions. You know, when they're in the wild. I mean, I, I think of like one client we have uses um, Gen AI for in the insurance industry, and uh, the idea is to help like underwriters or claims folks, you know, process things more quickly, which it does a great job at. But you know, if you look at kind of the next step. Um, they don't use it for chatbots like this, but I could see it would play a role, um, Gen AI, I mean, in like generating quotes for an insurance company. And what if it generates a quote that's just wildly 
off base. Right, you know, right. He picks up on it, you know. And and think, we've we've had guests on the show before that have told told us about. I guess there was a a, a car dealer somewhere that the chatbot allowed someone to buy a car for a dollar. Uh, there was yeah. another story this week in the Washington Post uh, that, that you had sent us, Paul, about um, Air Canada had a chatbot that basically promised the user a discount. Um, this user, his grandmother had died, and so he visited the website to book a flight for the funeral, and the chatbot told him, oh, sure, you have 90 days to uh, ask for the refund um, You know, once you get back. But then when he tried to get that discount, they were like, "Oh no, that you have to you have to ask for the discount before you go on the flight and not after." And it turns out that the chatbot was wrong, and so they he, they went to litigation, some kind of like Canada um, tribunal type thing, and and they agreed with the the guy and not and not Air Canada, so they had to actually give them the <laughs> give him the money back. But it's incidents like this that that should raise uh, the eyebrows and the ears of 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 especially businesses that are using this tech to try to provide accurate responses. If it's not, you know, if you're going to have some of these glitches, um, it might not be ready yet for prime time. And that, that's what you were, you were saying too, with, with some of your clients, yeah. right? Well, I think, yeah. That, and any, anybody who's really deep into this will tell you at this point, at least you need a human in the loop, as they say. Yeah. And to just do a check on exactly for things like that. You know, I mean, it's easy enough to pick up like in the underwriting example, if something is wildly out of, out of whack, a human will pick up on that. Yeah. But, you know, yeah. It, it definitely you know, makes that you. Pod. No, no, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say, like, it definitely makes you wonder, like, how it actually happened. Like, did someone just kind of make a typo and an update, you know, an updated piece of code, or maybe it was just overloaded? You know I, I, mean? I just think it makes that, you wonder. I just think it was some kind of hallucination with this chatbot where it may have inferred or it may have made an assumption about when the policy was versus the actual policy. Yeah. I mean, again, you get, you get policies at these companies and sometimes it's confusing. Um, it reminds me of trying to play some of those um, like magic, the gathering card games or those, those trading card games where you have a card that says one thing and then the other card contradicts that card. And then you have to figure out, well, which rule is correct. And uh, I think humans eventually can figure it out, but, Again, this chatbot, it was probably a case where they forgot to have a human check to see if this 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 answer was correct. Yeah. We get that a lot. So, uh, yeah, I, these things will still probably pop up every now and then, and it, it, it's great fodder for us to discuss. So um, I'm, I'm always happy with it. So, uh, all right, we're going to move on from uh, AI to security. The other big story, this another big story this week, uh, law enforcement agencies, including the FBI and the UK's National Crime Agency, have dealt a crippling blow to Lockbit, which was one of the world's most prolific cybercrime gangs, whose victims include Royal Mail and Boeing, among others. The 11 international agencies uh, were behind this Operation Kronos. They said this week that the uh, ransomware group, many of whose members are based in Russia, have been locked out of their own systems. Several of the group's key members have also been arrested, indicted, or identified, and its court technology seized, including hacking tools and its dark web homepage. Um, all right, there's a quote about uh, the the infiltration, and basically the, this guy, his name was Graham Bigger, the NCA Director General. Uh, he said, Lockbit has caused enormous harm and cost. No longer, as of today, Lockbit is effectively redundant. And then he does this really stupid quote, which he goes, Lockbit has been locked out. Ugh. <laughs> I see what he did yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so five defendants have been charged in the U.S., including two Russian nationals. Two of the five are in custody. Another two alleged members of the gang were arrested in Ukraine and Poland. Uh, with the law enforcement officials promising more to come. In fact, the State Department put out a press release um, asking, basically offering rewards for more information on make, like who some of these uh, leaders are and some of the people that are involved in it. Um, I'm I'm actually very happy that the, this this finally came out because for the better part of the last couple of years, we have not heard a lot around law enforcement and ransomware. And it did feel like that the, the ransomware gangs were winning. We've done a couple of episodes on this show talking about the, the problem of ransomware and how it continues to, to, to happen. And I was starting to think that companies are basically ignoring the advice to not pay the ransom. Uh, and they're just paying ransoms now if, if, if they have critical systems. Um, Paul, you were interested in this story too. What, what, you know, what's your take on, does this mean that there's still hope for the rest of us uh, in in this fight? 
I'm not so sure. <laughs> you know, anytime bad guys get taken down, it's a good thing, obviously. Whether it makes a dent in the whole ransomware landscape, yeah. I, I, it needs to be seen because, I mean, normally these ransomware groups, they sort of fold up their tent, you know, before that gets to this point when they, they kind of feel the heat come in and they'll just close up shop and then crop, you know, crop up later under a different name a couple months later. Um, so that could still happen here. You know, the, the fact that they made arrests is a good thing. Um, they, they got some, I guess, intellectual property, you might say. I, I, I have to believe the, the perpetrators probably have copies of all that, you know, and they can just, like I said, start up again in a couple of months. Yeah. Within the last couple of years, though, I, I we, we've had some people on the show talk to us about how brazen some of these groups are and, that, and, had, and have been getting. Uh, when we talked about the big MGM hack last year uh, in Las Vegas, there were groups that basically came out, raised their hand, and they said, oh, yeah, we did it, and here's how we did it. Um, this yeah. was through the, I think they did social engineering through LinkedIn that they were able to find um, key IT help people to basically give them the passwords. Um, and it was weird to me about how how they were bragging about it. And there was like, well, yeah, because they're probably in all these different countries and law enforcement can't reach them. So it was interesting to see that there was this cooperation that you saw in, in, in a lot of these countries. Um, but some of the five of the people that were arrested were in the U.S. I'm like, what are you doing in the U.S.? Like, if you're going to do all this bad stuff, get out of this country because they're going to yeah. catch, you know, you're likely what do you to think the chances are those two Russian nationals are ever going to get, you know, extradited to the U.S.? Well, they probably yeah, they probably won't. But I don't know. It, it does feel interesting that at least there was some cooperation that was going on. Um, but you're right. I mean, it does feel like is this just a small dent uh, in the in, in the whole big picture? Yeah, like I said, it remains to be seen. I, you know, this. I don't know if you read much about this business model they had, but it, it seemed like it would be pretty effective because what, it was basically like a franchise model. So the guys, you know, doing the work on the ground kept like something like eighty percent of the ransom, and they kick up twenty percent to the you know up the ladder. So that's pretty good. Yeah, and, you know, those guys making the eighty percent. You know, you got to believe they're just going to look for the next thing. Oh, I mean, they're not going away. If they weren't caught, like, do you think that these people that were caught were part of the lower part of the organization, or were were more? That's a good. The upper that's part. a good question. Yeah, I, I, I got the sense they were higher up, but you know, I I don't know that for yeah. sure. Well, when I put on my tin hat, I start thinking that like you know, once these guys get caught by the government, that they get put to work for the government doing. Um, state to state uh, type of of and maybe that's why there hasn't there hasn't been a lot of these big announcements about criminals being taken down, um, but that's yeah. probably my tin foil hat. Well, that's Leo DiCaprio in Catch Me If You Can, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, you know, you know, I've, I'm I'm pretty sure that that that's why we didn't see anything in the MGM thing. But maybe again, maybe we'll 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 see something down the road. Um, all right, so. Uh, yeah, I guess I guess we'll just wait and see to see if more of these things are coming down the coming down the pike. Um, do you have an opinion on you know whether companies should should pay ransom for ransomware attacks or like where do you stand on that, Paul? That's a tough one. I, you know, I, I can't say I have an opinion. It probably depends on the situation. Um, yeah, I think you know the government. I think tells you not to, but. You know, it depends on how much they're asking for one thing. Oh, it, it does seem like once you pay it, you're just going to keep paying it because, you know. Right. Once you pay it and the, the, the bad guys know you paid it, why wouldn't they come back again and again? You know? Yeah, there was some question about whether the, uh, I think now that the government has seized, seized the, inform, you know, seized these servers, there was the potential that they didn't know if they could get their money back, the people that paid the ransom. Um, but there was also an implication that they might be able to get their data back as well. Um, so it did feel like maybe that the, the lockbit people weren't kind of following through on what they had promised, or I mean, it does feel like maybe they ticked off someone and that's how the government went after them. Like they, they, they went past the normal operating procedures of what ransomware groups are supposed to do. Again, maybe I'm just assuming all, a lot of this stuff. I will say, you know, I do have a number of clients in the security space and <clears throat> I mean, I'm convinced if you just take a fraction of what you might have to pay in a ransom and use it for defensive or, or even offensive security like yeah. tests, 
you'll be much better off because I mean, if, if you're harder to get into than the next guy, they're just going to move along. You know, they're not going to spend a ton of time on you. So to me, that was make the most sense, you know, and in, invest in some, some decent security, you know, whether it's managed detection and response uh, kinds of things, so right. you can detect things before it gets to this point where you're forced to pay a ransom. So. Okay. Uh, we're going to, we're going to shift gears from this story to uh, another one. We uh, are, there's a couple of uh, Tesla stories that were in the news. Uh, the Washington post had a story about, uh, it was a pretty impressive story about a worker who worked for Tesla uh, was killed in a uh, crash in 2022. Uh, but apparently this might be the first fatality around full self-driving, which is the, the Tesla aut- autonomous uh, feature. Uh, before this happened, there were a lot of accidents um, where it was the automated assisted driving, but people assumed that it was full driving, and a lot of people got in trouble because they were not, you know, they didn't, ha- they had their hands off the wheel and for whatever. Uh, but this this accident, uh, the Washington Post writes, um, they feel like this is the first one of this full self driving. Uh, fatality. So what happened was was that there were two people that were on their way to play golf uh, in 2022 when uh, the the guy's Tesla suddenly swerved off of the road. The car's driver assistance software, full self-driving, was struggling to navigate um, some mountain curves, forcing this guy to repeatedly yank it back on course. And then, so on the way home, the Tesla Model 3 barreled into a tree and exploded in flames, killing the, uh, his name was uh, Hans von Ohain, a Tesla employee and a devoted fan of CEO Elon Musk. Uh, The other guy in the car, his name was uh, Eric Rossiter. He survived the crash and told emergency responders that von Ohain was using an auto drive feature on the Tesla that just ran straight off the road. Uh, and basically this, this story goes through and, and explains the whole situation. Um, it's not a good sign for, for Tesla in this case, whether they, you know, I mean, there, there's other parts of the story where they kind of took like the, his widow, they, you know, he, they interview his widow and, um, there's a lot of other features of this story. Apparently the two of the, the two guys had been drinking as well. And so there, that, that comes up into the conversation as well, but, um, does not look good. F- Again, we've talked on the show a couple times about uh, problems that autonomous vehicles are having. So, um, yeah, like what? What you know? Should should Tesla just back off of this feature or admit that this still might not be having problems, Paul? Uh, maybe. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this was just an awful story. Yeah. I mean, this guy, you can sort of picture it. You know, he was very proud to work for Tesla, proud of his company trusted the technology, you know, to a fault, apparently. Um, so, you know, I've, I've tried it. A friend of mine has has a Tesla and um, Keith, you know, we, we live in Massachusetts. So we're, we're on Cape Cod for July 4th weekend, right? Very yep. busy weekend. And we're coming up to the Bourne Rotary, which is, you know, Rotary in Massachusetts. Uh, <laughs> you sort of have to live here to, you know, it, it's a competition when you get into <laughs> Yeah, there's a lot, a lot of people that not understand what to do yeah. when, so you, he when you get to using, a rotary. Uh, he was using the, I think, the driver assist or whatever they call it, not, not the full-on, sure. you know, the car. But even then, you know, as soon as we get to the rotary, he's like, yeah, forget it. You know, this thing can't handle this, this rotary. And, and he was right because there was no way. So, uh, you know, I certainly wouldn't trust the full-on, you know, self-driving uh, bit at this point. Um but, you know, I, I, that's not to say you should give up on the technology. You know, on the other hand, like you said, these guys had been drinking. So maybe the car was was better off than than, than they were. You know, in, in some instances, you could see how a self-driving car would be better than a drunk driver. Right. Right. That's the whole that was that's one of the points that a lot of these technology people are, are, are saying is like you won't have drunk drivers because, you, you know, the, the car will take over or the car, the car will do all the driving for you. But it still feels like there's too many other obstacles out there, including other drivers and, you know, humans on the road doing dumb things as well that, um, but it, it, it's weird that something like that would just be like, okay, a glitch off the road. Um, a lot of this technology relies on lane markers. And uh, again, you and I live in, in New England when it snows, there's no good way for a car to determine where the road is. I mean, even a human driver sometimes has to figure out what lane you're in. If, if it's, if you're out there and it's snowing and the snow is covered, um, some of these lane markers, 
Um, I, I, I visited a couple of companies that are trying to do like ground-based radar to figure out where the, the road is versus um, the surface. So there are, there are some interesting technologies out there, but they have not yet been fully uh, commercially developed and applied. Um, yeah, and the reason that I wanted to bring this story up is because there was another story about Tesla, and this is the Cybertruck, where owners are reporting that um, this the stainless steel frame on the uh, their vehicles are developing, and and they use this in quotes, either corrosion or rust. They're starting to find some orange spots, uh, and apparently. Um, there's a guy named Will who posted on the Cybertruck Owners Club that he began documenting the corrosion on his new Cybertruck. He noticed his vehicle had developed rust marks just after 11 days of ownership. He said he had 381 miles on it when he first developed the odd, when he first discovered the odd specs. And basically he said, uh, throughout the LA rain, I noticed that the corrosion was forming on the metal like other people have noted. So I decided to start documenting it and bringing it to Tesla's attention. I figured it was already on their radar, but he wanted it he wanted it attended to under the warranty. And so that, that this became a big deal where, you know, is this really stainless steel? Is this rust? Chris, have you been following this at all? Yeah, I actually heard yeah. about this, I think, a week ago. Um, from what I can tell, or, or from what they say online, um, it uses uh, 300 series stainless steel. And the reason why they chose that is because it's corrosion resistant. Um, but not corrosion proof, I guess. Would that be the the, the right the so, legalese that the that Tesla would use? I I think what people might be noticing, and again, I'm not. I don't know anything about metal. <laughs> <laughs> right. I'm not like a you know an engineer or anything like that. But it could just be surface rust. Okay. Stuff you know, it's rust that just forms on the surface. Um, there might be like. You know, it also depends, I think, on how the stainless steel is coated, if it's coated with anything. Um, if there's any contaminants underneath the coating, it could just be it oxidizing. I, I, I don't know. Um, but that would be really sucky if if the Cybertrucks just started to just rust <laughs> after being out in the rain. That would be, whew. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, with, with regular cars, Man. and again, I'm going to bring up the fact that we're from New England. There's, you know, the under the under part of the car with all of the salt that gets put on the road to to melt ice on, on roads, you know, there's always a concern that you're, the bottom of your car, the longer you have it, you're going to have, start having rust and corrosion. Right. Um, you know, I've got a, a, a car that's now 15, 14 years old and they've got it's got rust spots on different parts of the car where like I've, I've, it's been dented and then you start to see corrosion on the, yeah. on the dent. It, like once you get into that part. Um, yeah. Do you think that stories like this are just being done just to try to like to make Elon Musk look bad? And, no, and, no, I don't think so. You don't no, think I, there's I, a coordinated I, attempt by media people? No, like, I don't think so. I think that's a valid... I think it's a... No, honestly, it's a valid I don't know. Concern. That sounds really like sarcasm from you, Chris. No, I'm serious. No, you're driving a... From Any, what looks to be a plain steel car, right? Yeah. And you're noticing rust on it. That would be a big concern. Yeah, scroll up a little bit more because you're you're getting an ad there. <laughs> oh yeah. I chime in here. I, I had read something where some engineer said it wasn't rust at all. It, it could be easily cleaned off. With, okay. Uh, yeah. You yeah. Know, one of those hot scrubbing brushes, but you know, still, I don't know. To me, I think if I paid eighty thousand dollars and I started seeing something like this, I'd be a little concerned, right? Yeah. I, and that's probably where the the owners are are be like, you know, am I seeing this? Are other people seeing this? And that's where he goes on the forum and. But to, for this to, for this to be then blown up to a bigger bigger story, I start to think that maybe there's people that just want to go after Elon Musk be, because they don't like him. Maybe, but yeah. you know, it's, so this is what you get for buying a truck that's that ugly. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, how you know? D does anyone remember? Were, were they basically saying this was rust proof, or or were they just be like? There's an assumption that if it's made of stainless steel, it will never rust or, or you know. It, yeah. yeah, that was the assumption. And it's yeah. not even painted, which kind of astounds me. I don't know. Well, yeah, that's the other thing, because typically cars today, it's primed and then it's coated with paint. Yeah. For right. the very reason of rust protecting, protection. yeah, protecting the metal from being rusted. But yeah, I don't know. I mean, you know, 
to what you're saying, you know, it's, it's probably nothing. It's probably just surface related and that's it. Okay. You know, maybe it's, I don't know. Hey, it's a new design. It's a new concept so, of a car. I wonder we'll, if any, we'll find out in a couple of years. I wonder if any of these owners have gone to the car wash yet, like those automated car washes and, and paid the extra $3 for the, the rust proofing under the car. Um, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, the car washes are going to have to have scotch scrubbing brushes, apparently. Do you, but, uh, it, well, do you think that that like a one of those cyber trucks would even fit in one of those automated? It might, it might actually break the question. automated machines. Like yeah. if it's on like one of those trolley kind of you know rails. Yeah, because it weighs a lot. Right. I figure those guys are probably just then hand washing all of this stuff, right? Yeah. Maybe I'll you know, join that forum and see how people are washing these cars if they're washing it at all. Uh, all right. Hey. hey, speaking of speaking, it's, it's a great segue. Speaking of of water and and washing stuff and technology, uh, apparently there was a story this week uh, from MacWorld, our, our friends at MacWorld. Uh, I, I'm going to give them the original credit, but uh, apparently, if your iPhone gets wet now, putting it in a bag of rice is a bad move, according to Apple. Um, ever since cell phones were a thing, we've been dropping them in water. And while today's iPhones are resistant to splashes, dips, and dunks, there are still times when they get too wet and the dreaded liquid detection alert appears on the screen. I didn't even know they had that. I guess newer, newer models might have this detection alert. Um, but then, you know, at that point, everyone, it's, it's almost like an urban legend or now it's apparently an urban myth where you take a bag of rice and you stick it in there and apparently the rice absorbs all of the wetness and you can be saved from the frying the internal parts of the iPhone. I think I've tried it with two different devices. One time it worked and one time it didn't. Um, but now apparently Apple says that this is not a great idea uh, because uh, it you know, a, a new 2024 support document says actually advises against using rice to dry out the iPhone because it could make matters worse because you could be allowing small particles of rice to damage the iPhone. Um, what's interesting is that this story went viral, like to every other tech media site. Maybe it's just because it's so easy to write about, but I, I felt like it was like, wow, you know, we're, we're telling or or they've detected that Apple has now switched its stance or or maybe finally made a uh, a statement about this whole bag of rice thing. It's bad news for the rice industry, I guess. I guess well, it's probably not. <laughs> More people are probably eating rice than putting, you know, their wet iPhones yeah, in like there. 5 or 10 years too late. I mean, I, I thought this issue was kind of put to bed because the the phones can handle water better than they used to, you know. Right. So I don't, right. I don't, I don't really get why this is coming up now. But. Have, have you ever have you ever done the bag of rice thing, Paul, with with any of your devices? No, I I've never dropped my phone in water. I drop it on the floor in the driveway all the time. That yeah. to me is a bigger issue. But <laughs> yeah, Chris, no. any well, you don't have an iPhone, but you have you have other phones. Yeah, I have a Pixel. I mean, I just don't drop my phone. Period. <laughs> It's usually you, how I roll. <laughs> you, uh, you've never stumbled and, and, and tripped and had it fall anywhere. Well, actually, Always a firm grip. Yeah. Firm grip. I, I think I did it a couple times only because the kids have done it. I've Now, I've spilled soda on my Mac keyboard, um, and that freaked me out. And, that, and that, I did that and was able to get everything except for the monitor graphic card to start working again. Um, but I can then hook it to an external monitor, and the the computer would still work. This was a, a personal one, not not this not this official one. Um, yeah, I, I felt like that as they were making improvements to water resistance, that you wouldn't have to do this bag of rice trick out there. But apparently, there's enough phones out there where this still happens. But um, maybe Apple could, you know, allow people to uh, repair their phones and open them up rather than this whole bag of rice trick anyway. No, they don't want you to do that. I know. Huh. I know. You're not going to repair your own phone. <laughs> That's a radical idea, Keith. I know, I know. All right, uh, one, uh, another story that came out this week was that um, Walmart uh, has basically, uh, they are agreed to acquire Vizio uh, in a $2.3 billion deal, and they uh, basically are saying the acquisition is official in a move to boost its ad business. Uh, what's interesting about this is that, this is a quote, the acquisition of Vizio and its SmartCast operating system would enable Walmart to connect with and serve its customers in new ways, including innovative television and in-home entertainment media experiences. Uh, it would create 
new opportunities to help advertisers connect with consumers, empowering brands with differentiated and compelling opportunities to engage at scale and to realize greater impact from their advertising spend with Walmart. Vizio has more than 500 direct advertiser partnerships thanks to its Vizio platform plus business, which the company says now accounts for a majority of the company's gross profit. Their smart TV OS smartcast is also used by more than 18 million active accounts. What's interesting to me on this front, there's two, there's two parts. I, when I went and read the comments on the story, most people felt that Vizio as a brand had been kind of downgraded over the years. Uh, other budget TV brands like Hisense and TCL, I believe, is the other one, uh, you know, have grown in, in importance versus Vizio. So, and then when, with, with Walmart acquiring them, they, they were like, well, that means you know, they're just, it, Vizio is going to be just like this budget, budget brand. Um, but I started thinking about it, like this whole story means that it's more about what's inside the TV than maybe the features of the TV itself. And I felt that was weird because I always felt like, especially when you talk to TV guys, the people that are really into TVs, uh, it was always about the hardware, the technology, the, you know, yeah. however many pixels were in the screen and, you know, OLED. And I don't even know what kind of phone. Again, I know nothing about the hardware parts of the TV. Um, I also know that I have to buy TVs more often than I used to. Um, that's something that, you know, the quality keeps getting downgraded in the hardware part. Um, but now it's all about the software, and, and that was surprising to me. Um, like, what does this mean? Is it TV basically now just a platform for software interactivity and advertising, which you know kind of irritates me? Uh, Paul, are you seeing this too, or is or am I just coming out of this from like outer space? Uh, I don't think you're coming from outer space, but if, I guess I've insulated myself from this whole issue because. Yeah. I use Apple TV, so I just connect the TV to the Apple TV, and that is, in effect, the operating system, if you want to call it that. I mean, that's my interface to everything else. Oh, you're one of those Apple TV guys. Okay. All right. Yeah. I mean, it goes back years before TV <laughs> could do all this stuff. And yeah. I just never, in fact, I just bought a new Roku TV before the Super Bowl. We're having people over, so I'm yeah. using an, ex an excuse to upgrade my TV, and it worked. <laughs> Yeah. Like that. Well, so yeah, you know, I mean, Roku. Roku started its existence as a as a little box that you would plug right. into uh, a TV, and 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 again, I love the company because they've got the world's greatest remote for navigating the system, and their software is really good. And um, someone figured out, I was like, why are we building this little external device when we could just put it inside a regular TV? And again, yeah. that's why you know you see that. I think we have a sharp Roku TV as well. Um, Sharp makes the hardware, and then Roku does the software. You um, said the story. I got to thinking. I'm I'm really just using the TV as a monitor because I, I yeah connect to uh, some Sonos speakers, which are great. Like I said, I got to connect it to the Apple TV, so I turn it on. I you know I switch it to the Apple TV, and that's it. <laughs> right. The cable. I, I, the cable. I I'm just I'm just worried about. And again, maybe I'm not noticing this either. But I, I guess when I when I turn on my TV. There are through the interface and the you know when you're deciding what you want to watch and again I don't have cable, so I'm going through the the operating system on the TV and it's whatever channels you know Netflix Hulu, uh, you know Peacock whatever the streaming services that I'm using and I just navigate that way. But there are ads that pop up and I don't realize that there are ads or there are ads for other shows on other channels, so it hasn't hit my brain. But but this this announcement means that, again, users are just going to be inundated with ads before they can even decide what they're going to be watching or playing. And that's a little disturbing to me as well. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure if Walmart has anything to say about it, that's exactly what's going to happen. Yeah. You're going to see a lot of like, hey, click here to get another deal or sign up for Walmart Plus or whatever. And, um, you know, does that going to dr I'm wondering if that's going to drive down the cost of the TV as well. I, I, I think it's going to drive... Uh more people away from using the actual smart aspect of the TV. Um, I, I think a lot of households these days, you're going to have a console connected to your TV, whether it's a PlayStation, Xbox, or whatever. And yeah, like I, we have our PlayStation connected, and I never use the smart aspect of our TV because the console is just so much more faster. You know okay, I mean? so the, uh, that's yeah, interesting, so yeah, because I don't do that on my like I I only use my PlayStation to basically play games, and I know they've got all the different apps on there, but I just never made that leap because I had that. Maybe it's because I had the Roku, and I I just I just love that interface so much that 
Yeah, Roku. Roku is uh, you know yeah. use, using a Roku is convenient. Um, or if you have that, what is it like Amazon Fire? S- oh, those things. Thing. Oh, oh, that Amazon Fire you know, TVs are awful. Yeah, the, but I, I I despise those. But like at the end of the day, the other thing, the other thing too, you know, the other benefit you have with you know using a console is you get the Blu-ray player that's built in, so you can watch Blu-ray movies if those exist anymore. Jeez, but <laughs> I, uh, I I think if you're going to buy a TV today, you're going to look at the panel, the software, how the software maximizes the the quality of the panel and stuff like that. You know, whether it's OLED, QLED. I mean, there's so much. Yeah, I can't think of some of the new TV tech out there, but they're really, really pushing the quality of those panels. Yeah. And also the size. Price has gone down and and size of screens because manufacture the manufacturing process has gone easier. Yep. yep. So I think my, my brother he he just bought a uh, I think it's an eighty inch OLED T V a couple weeks ago. Wow. And man was I jealous. <laughs> that was a that's a TV. For for probably I th- I think he I don't know, it was around like fifteen hundred, something okay. like that. Okay. That's cheap. Yeah. I mean, think about it. An 80 inch so, for so, 1500 So, Paul, when you bought this TV for the Super Bowl, what were the factors of what made you choose the, the TV that you ended up getting? Like, did you have a list in your mind of, of what you wanted? Uh, mainly size. I mean, where it's go, it goes over a fireplace. And yeah. It's kind of, there's a, there's a wood, you know, sort of encasement to it. So I can only go so big. Right. So I wanted to get a little yeah. bigger than I had. And the, the one I had was pretty old. So it had still the, the things on the side, you know, took up space. And now that's that's kind of gone away. So for the, for the same size, I was able to get like a five inch bigger screen. It's like a 50 inch now. OK. In fact, I was a little pissed because I, I could have gone bigger. But, <laughs> but you so, know, I can't, so size was the factor. And then, then after that, was it was it price or brand or like because you you yeah, it was and picture quality really, um, and you know, and I just looked through the, the Roku was cheap. I think it was like two fifty, two sixty, something like that. Uh-huh. Did you did you go into the everything. store? Did you go into the store to buy it, or did you buy it online? I bought it online and just picked it up. Whoa! Uh, wow. <laughs> did a bunch of reviews, and I mean, it's fine. It, it's definitely a better picture than the one I had. Yeah, a little bit bigger, so. Yeah, because so, but you know, in the early days of of when TV started getting bigger and bigger, I bought this was before we had kids and when, when we actually had money. Uh, we bought a like a Toshiba rear projection, and this thing was like massive, um, yeah. and it took up about thirty percent of the room. And <laughs> when we finally got sick of that one, or when technologies got better and they started getting thinner and thinner and thinner, then we we went to a smaller version and we rearranged the room a little bit but now we're stuck in this like 40 to 50 inch rectangle diagonal thing we can never go to that like what chris was saying with this 80 inch thing i'm, I'm a little jealous too only because i don't have the room for it yeah. um i don't have a, a dedicated home theater area like some of my friends have and um, i'm jealous of them as well but yeah i guess it's i guess there's still i guess maybe now size is the biggest is the biggest factor over price and form and unless you're into really into that 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 technology resolution um didn't they say like at this point you're the human eye can't perceive all of these new k's that keep coming out right yeah it's it's yeah. it's it's marketing like <laughs> look, right. like right. after after 4k like 4k yeah. is really all you need but right. it's like if everybody has a 4k tv if you're LG, Samsung, Sony, Vizio, whatever, TCL, and all the other companies, how are you going to sell more TVs? Right. Well, you need to create something new. Right. And I, so I, change the 4K to an 8K, yeah, it's twice the amount, but you're really not going to yeah. know. You're not going to yeah. notice. And then there was the whole 3D thing that was that was popular for a, a couple of years or marketed for a couple of years you don't see that anymore of the people that are trying to push 3d i think the biggest thing this year at ces were these transparent screens now so now you've got a piece of glass and then you're watching tv but then then when the tv's off it becomes that's glass. cool that's really cool the transparent it's what was it sony lg I, sony or samsung was, i think it was lg well, yeah one of those guys yeah but, i mean that, that's you, that's really cool could you that's see something. that in your house at some point though uh, when it becomes affordable to us peasants out there, yeah, maybe. I mean, the first thing I think of is all the thumbprints that are going to go on that thing. No, no. Yeah. I hope my wife doesn't find out about that. <laughs> okay, well, don't show her. Don't show her the end of the show. Uh, one more, you know, there was one more TV-related thing I wanted to get to. Um, 
YouTube is now dominating TV streaming in the U.S., according to Nielsen. Uh, it, they released their January report on viewing usage across linear TV and streaming, uh, basically revealed that YouTube is once again the overall top streaming service in the U.S. with 8.6% of viewing on television screens. Netflix is at 7.9%, and the new data points to YouTube's dominance in the TV streaming arena and marks 12 consecutive months of the platform being in the top spot. Um, wow, this is news, huh? Well, there was something that I think what was interesting to me in this was they also then announced that viewers watch a daily average of over 1 billion hours of YouTube content on their televisions. Oh, yeah. yeah. Which could indicate that there's a preference for user-generated videos among U.S. consumers rather than traditional TV shows. 61% of Generation Z reported that they favor user-generated content over other content formats. Um, I have noticed anecdotally that I, I will watch a lot of YouTube on my TV. I'll still do it on the phone, and every now and then I'll do it on the computer if, if, if I have one in front of me. But that little YouTube app on my Roku TV, that gets a lot of usage. And, and, and I watch um, my favorite show, which is um, the Tech Talk channel, of course. But other app, you know, I do watch other other programs, other shows. But um, I just wait the like the way that they look on the TV versus on a smaller screen on my phone or or. Uh, but my kids are still on their phones, so they yeah. they haven't made that move yet. So yeah. um, I I, th I thought it was interesting that um, they had that Generation Z uh, demographic number. Yeah, I mean it, it's I had the same experience as you, Keith. Like you know, I got two kids, they're yeah, nineteen and twenty one, and they they watch youtube you know almost endlessly on their phones or maybe the laptop but i've never seen them put it on the tv yeah do they do they do they take their the, the the something that they're watching they try to like stream cast it or they try to cast it from the phone over to the nope. to the tv cuz i know a lot of those newer phones have that ability I mean, they could, but they don't. They're happy with the phone or whatever. They don't care. It, the only time it happens with us is when someone inadvertently does it and they make a mistake and then I'm watching TV and then all of a sudden someone else, some other video will pop up and yeah. I'm like, who the hell is watching YouTube on, on their phone? And I have to kind of like tell them to stop so that it or stop doing that because sometimes uh, that feature will take over. Um, but, you know, those are some stats. I, I like throwing in stats every now and then. Um but Chris, you feel like this is not really surprising to you? Yeah, no. It, it's kind of I, you know to be expected. I just like yeah. it because we're on YouTube as well, and so yay YouTube, I guess, is what I'm saying at the moment. Uh, all right, so Paul, thanks for joining us on the show this week. This was a, a, a good start, and we'll uh, and we'll see you next week when uh, we talk more about some other tech news. So thanks again. My pleasure, Keith. Thanks for having me. All right, that's all the time we have for today's episode. Don't forget to like the video, subscribe to the channel, add any comments you have below. Join us every week for new episodes of Today in Tech. I'm Keith Shaw. Thanks for watching.